How's everybody doing out there? Welcome back to a special Thursday edition of the Butcher's Fresh Cuts. A proud member of the Miller Park Minute Radio Podcast Network. I got a big grin on today, so does Freddie, because we got Eric in the house today. How you doing, Eric? I am doing great. Throwing strikes, getting likes, hitting dingers, getting listeners. Every day, every day. Well, it's good to see you, buddy. It's nice to get you on a pod here. We can finally team up and do some stuff together. And um, we'll we'll talk about today's hot topics and all the news that's been coming out because we're, we've hit that point in the offseason where stuff's just firing off constantly. And I know Eric's just going to itching to talk about all that stuff. But we have a very special uh, topic that we were excited to bring you guys today. I'm personally very excited for it. It's something that I've been hyping up on these episodes since we since I started here. And I'm really excited for it. And that would be the NL Central Hall of Fame. Um, I, I, you've heard me in a couple of podcasts uh, recently mentioning guys who look like Colton Wong, who are absolute Hall of Famers in the NL Central Hall of Fame. So I figured today we would we would give you the inaugural class of the NL Central Hall of Fame. Um, but first, I'd like to give a little brief history on the division because it, this division hasn't been here forever. It's it's it is a relatively young division. What do you got, Eric? I just wanted to, uh, uh, but first, we're, we're presented today by SeatGeek. Ooh, SeatGeek. Use the code Miller Cart Park Minute at SeatGeek.com. $20 off your first order. Uh, and we're on Pocket Cast. Uh, this is a 5.30 a.m. every day. We are here every day. Butcher's here once a week. Going to be more than that soon. I'm holding them to it. Uh, but yeah, no, Pocket Cast. Uh, Google, Amazon, anywhere you find a podcast, Apple, Spotify, Anchor, you name it, we're there. Sorry. I had Absolutely. To get there. Yeah, you got to get that in there. Eric is a pro's pro. I'm just <laughs> learning off his cues here. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so you can find us in all those places. And also, please uh, please talk to us. Please comment, uh, subscribe, uh, give us your feedback. I'd love to hear your submissions for the NL Central Hall of Fame. I'd love to hear your guys' feedback. Uh, we, we love interacting with you guys and it's huge. It's huge. We love having you guys a part of this. Um, but like I said, I want to get into the a uh, little bit of the history of the NL Central. It's a division that hasn't been around forever. It's just under 30 years old. In fact, um, it was created in 1994. Um, two teams from uh, to create the division, two teams moved from the NL West, the Reds and the Astros, and three teams moved from the NL East to the Pirates, the Cubs and the Cardinals. Uh, originally, the Atlanta Braves were slated to move to the Central instead of the Pirates, but the Braves requested to stay in the East in hopes to form a rivalry with the newly formed uh, Florida Marlins at the time. The Florida Marlins came in and the Braves, they said, no, we want to stick around and beat the living crap out of those fish. So we would like to stay in the NL East. So the Pirates were then moved. And actually, since the realignment, this is news to me, uh, the Pirates have made several unsuccessful attempts to go back to the NL East. They want to go back to the NL East. That's where the Pirates were a great ball club of, over their entire history. But since they've been in the Central, they've basically been a tanking team. So they've tried. Um, and then in 19, uh, actually, the, the Brewers at this time, they were playing in the AL East, so along with the Yankees, the Orioles, and teams like that. And they, they were then moved to the newly formed AL Central at that time. So in 94, the AL Central and the NL Central both started. Until finally in 1998, the Brewers, our home, hometown ball club, they swapped leagues and ended up where they reside now in the great NL Central, the best division in baseball. Upon the Brewers' arrival in the NL Central, it became the largest division in baseball, sporting six teams until 2013, finally, when the Astros became just the second team in history to swap leagues after the Brewers were the first to do it in 98. And they joined the AL West, where they have been dominating that division now for well over half of a decade. Um, in the NL Central, the Cardinals have the most division crowns with 12 out of the 26. Uh, the Cubs have six division titles. The Astros have four. They still have more than us, and they haven't even been in the division since 13. The Reds and the Brewers each have three, and the Pirates have never won the NL Central. No wonder they want to go back to the East, uh, but they do sport three wild card wins. So the Pirates have had minor success since their move uh, back in 94. Um, so I'm making moves, though. Bit, making moves. Yeah, I mean... I think I, I, I told Eric today in a, in a message after doing some research on the Pirates and they are my bandwagon team over the next 10 years. <laughs> I will, I'm not in full support of the Pirates. I'm a Brewers fan first. I like the Mariners, but I like the things that the Pirates are doing. And that's the first time I can say that in a long, long time. They have a lot of young talent there. And I think in about a 
decade, they'll be fighting. Maybe a little less than a decade, they'll be fighting for the, the NL pennant, I think. And maybe they'll finally get to move back to the East once they win something. So about the Hall of Fame, the plan today is to induct the inaugural class of Butcher's NL Central Hall of Fame. This list is not necessarily the best players to, that, that have spent time in the division. There, and there is some rough criteria for these players to make it. So for instance, CC Sabathia, though he is a legendary pitcher who would make it in a number of other Hall of Fame lists, including the actual Hall of Fame that, that anyone could put together, he had bought a cup of coffee in the Central, so his contributions would inherently fall short of making this Hall of Fame. Uh, some players might make it in who don't have eye-popping numbers necessarily, but they were serviceable talents for one or more NL Central ball clubs for an extended period of, period of time. And lastly, if you're a dude who's played for four or more NL Central teams, you're basically getting it no matter what. I don't care what your numbers look like. If you've been on four teams in the NL Central, you basically get in. Also, uh, this is merely just the inaugural class, and it's not. these aren't all going to be first ballot guys. That's too easy to do. You can go to any YouTube show. You can go to any podcast and hear guys talk about Albert Pujols, and you can hear him talk about Yadi Molina. I'm, those guys are in. Don't get me wrong, but I want to talk about some guys that might bring a smile to your face who you maybe haven't thought about in a while. And I know Eric has some excellent guys for this. So we're going to do this in a format where I'm going to give a guy, Eric's going to give a guy, and you guys are going to give us your guys and your comments, okay? And you're going to, you're going to criticize our list, and, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so without further ado, um, here's the inaugural class, uh, the 2023 class of the NL Central Hall of Fame. Let's get to it. So, Eric people out there my first pick I think is about the perfect player for this hall of fame there's no player that embodies the spirit of the NL Central Hall of Fame more than the great Aramis Ramirez this 18 year old third base vet of vets spent all 18 years of his career in the NL Central he played for three of the six teams who have been housed in the division over its history he spent his first five seasons in Pittsburgh before moving to the Cubs where he would enjoy the prime of his career and rack up two of his three all-star selections Oh, Eric's making money over there. I like it. In 2012, he came to us with the Brewers, where he would give us four fantastic seasons, where he batted 284, he hit 65 ding-dongs, 262 RBIs, to a 120 OPS plus over that four years. He would spend his age 37 and final season back with the team who drafted him in Pittsburgh. In that final 2015 season, on September 9th, this is a fun stat, Eric, you're going to love this. In his final season, he's back with the ball club in Pittsburgh, back with his home team. On September 9th, in his 18th season, uh, Aramis played a position other than third base for the first time in his career where, where he suited up as a first baseman. 18 years, he always played third base. They never shifted him second. I mean, this guy was old. He played a long time. And he, was, <laughs> he managed to, to stick, with the, stick with that position until finally on September 9th of 15 in his final season. He's one of the best Dominican infielders of all time, and he doesn't get enough love. Um, in his 18-year career, he batted a very respectable 283. Um, he's in the 2000 hit club with 2,303. He hit 386 career home runs, uh, more than Prince Fielder hit in his career, and he batted in 1,417 runs. He has a career 833 OPS, and he finished his career 15% better than the average league hitter throughout his career. Um, he accumulated 32.4 wins above replacement in his career. Beloved, a member of three different teams in the Central for the course of the time that it takes a baby to be born until being an adult, 18 years. He is the essential NL Central Hall of Famer, and he's the first inductee. Here's to Aramis. What do you think? <laughs> I was trying to hit that one the whole time. I just beautiful. hit the. There's four buttons, and I managed to hit the button wrong four times. So, so that's why we made three times. Ta three times they were all supposed to be claps. <laughs> <laughs> but very yeah, good, very good. I, I promise Ramirez, and and he was one of those guys too. Like I remember, uh, in my you know kind of it was kind of early late to you know like. 20s Brewers fandom that I had actually uh, met uh, at a game one time, and uh, he was a really nice guy, uh, signing balls, you know, along the side. And I just, I just said hello. I didn't have anything to sign because I was holding a beer in my hand, you know. <laughs> sign my beer. I love you, Aramis. No, <laughs> that probably was what I did. I don't. Honestly, really in Milwaukee, he's probably signed beers before. Right, right. But yeah, so, he was a classic. I mean, class he was one too, and you did, you know, 
I always like when they're playing and I don't like the player. If you have a little bit of hate in the rivalry for the player, one of my players really classifies this for me. Um, but now I can say I love him because he's no longer on a rivalry team. Um, but, you know, there were some years I, I did not like him. Um, and I go to, um, I think about that um, the no-hitter that was thrown in Miller Park by uh, Zambrano. Yes. Brown. Another another great NL Central name, uh, and uh, Aramis Ramirez, I believe, I believe hit a home run in that game, mm. and I remember watching that game mm. because it was being played at Miller Park, and I was like, oh, I, I love to hate this guy. I hate to love, <laughs> him. you know, it was one of those situations. So yeah, and he and he's one of those guys that spends so much time on a rival team in his career that you just like. You get sick of seeing that face. It's like, I mean, I always loved Yachty, but I always hated him. I always loved to hate Yachty or Molina because he just beat the shit out of us. And, and sorry, my language, but he was just a oh yeah a cancer on our on our team for for years and years. And and, and then the guy joins your. I mean, we'll talk about another guy, but Andrew McCutcheon, like he would. Carlos Chapman is another one I think of. <laughs> this Chapman, um, yeah. because and I'm talking good. Not post like you know Yankees Cub situation a role as Chapman. I'm talking about when when he was a flamethrower. When, when he, was, he was with the Reds, he was a flamethrower like nothing we had ever seen. Kind of reminiscent to me of a Hunter Green. Oh, you know, yeah, you Hunter see Green. that Hunter Green is that flamethrower guy that that's just scary to see as an opposing team. You 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 look at the probables and you see Hunter Green, you're like, ooh, this could be a bad day. Yeah, you know, as much about, as he has inconsistencies, I mean, he's still very good. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't like facing Hunter Green anytime it came up, and it was the same with Chapman and with Green. It's the almost a scarier thing because the guy is a starter, <laughs> and he can just whip a ball. So Amazing. yeah, but back to Ramos Ramirez, just a legend and truly, I mean, when you go over his numbers, he he played his best ball in Milwaukee, and that's mm -hmm. it's really fun to think about. He was a, he was a great baller for us. Great stand-up ball player, 18-year vet in the NL Central, first ballot. All right, who do you got as your first ballot? All right, so this is gonna this is gonna be the trick here. So my first, my first, I'm gonna give give a little info about my guy, and then I'll I'll talk more about him. Uh, so he's a one-time All-Star. Uh, he has a Silver Slugger. Okay. <laughs> this is gonna, this is gonna, uh, he is from Mexico. Uh, he pitched with the Brewers. Oh, yeah, that's right. I said pitched with the Brewers, even okay, though he's got okay. Silver Slugger. Silver Slugger. Um, and uh, spent some time outside of us with a handful of ball clubs. Tried to make a return. Um, and that is Giovanni Gallardo. So Giovanni Yo. Gallardo. Won 121 games and lost 101. He has a 406 career ERA, 319 games, um, one save, 1800 innings, uh, 1584 strikeouts, and a 22.3 overall uh, wins above replacement. Now, the reason that this guy uh, really stands out is the amount of time he spent with the Brew Crew. And he was the ace. Uh, I think he still stands as having the most opening day starts, like back to back to back. Uh, I was right. in sheets. I think he had, what was it, four or five? Um, but the other significance of this is, the other significance and why the Silver Slugger is important. One second. I got to step off screen for a second. He's got something for us. This bad boy right here. We got. Is that from the game? Or... This is 527-14. Pitcher McFarland, batter, Gallardo, walk off RBI double in the tenth nice. inning. Did you they buy pinch that? it in bat? Yeah, I spent way too much money on this. You know, cool. all like two hundred bucks plus, close to three hundred. <laughs> a game-winning RBI ball, I would say. 
And this 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 ball bounced over the fence. It's authenticated, so look at that. It's legit and real. I showed this on another podcast one time, actually. Beautiful. But, yeah. I, I love Giovanni. Uh, one of my first gifts from my wife was a Giovanni Gallardo jersey. Uh, real deal. It's still in my closet. Uh, he's just one of those guys, and he was he had his streaks. I mean, his ERA doesn't say lights out guy. I mean, that that's that's a that's like a mid ERA. It's not a that's perfect a, ERA, and that's, that's not back end career stuff, right? You know? you know, and he did he did get hit to uh, to tar when in his time with Baltimore and Texas and stuff like that. But there was there was a lot of time that he was the ace of our staff and he was lights out, and that was the fun part of Giovanni Gallardo. Was the lights out baseball, yeah. and you didn't know he was kind of like a. I'd relate him more to Freddie than I would like a Corbin, uh, just in the fact that like fastball stuff. You know what I mean? He was more right. he more pounded fastballs than anything, but he get lit up too, and that was, I think, product of the system at the time in Milwaukee. We didn't garner this pitching prowess that we have now until later you know what i mean like that came under the craig council era that wasn't under the yost um you know doug melvin yeah melvin era of baseball right. in milwaukee it was so I mean, yeah and and not a lot and not enough gets talked about like when when teams are going through losing seasons and they're and and he went through some winning seasons with the brewers but i mean he carried mm-hmm. a, he carried the, the staff for for many many years when when we needed a, a guy to carry a staff and like, just because the team wasn't winning all their games, just because he wasn't, uh, an a, wouldn't be an ace on other staffs. I mean, he's a serviceable pitcher that I'm sure drove other teams in the NL central crazy over the course of years. You know, it's like, ah, it's another yo start. Like he knows our, he knows our lineup. Here we go. And right. you know, if a, a 403 ERA, if you take away the back end of the career stuff where, where, you know, a guy gets older and he slips and you're bouncing around on teams the guy was an excellent serviceable pitcher, and I think he's an excellent pick for the Hall of Fame. Did you know he actually played in Cincinnati, too? I do not know that he had a couple over there. A little bit. So, a little he, bit. so, Two so there you go. Two so there you go. There's more another time. Perfect, another perfect candidate for the NL Central. So, yeah, that's another year in the NL Central. He, yeah. So, I think he was of that era. Him and Ben Sheets can kind of be, kind of be drawn similarly because they were both – the best we had at a time when we had nothing. Right. You know, to be the best guy on a team that's got really nothing is kind of good. And he All swung the, the bat. The world. He swung the bat. That's and key. He, swung bat. he won a silver slugger. Like, Yo. in, that, in that pitcher's hitting era of baseball, I will forever love that home run by Brian yeah. Woodruff and that home run by Brent Suter. And I, I, I will still say that Brandon Woodruff's home run against uh, Clayton Kershaw is the biggest home run in Brewers history. Yes, indeed. Biggest indeed. home run. I'm just seeing the guy's batting stats for him. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look like they have his hitting stats. No. Oh, well. All right. Like, well, we got two in the book. We got two in the books. I think Yo is a perfect candidate. And yeah, I didn't even know that he played for two NL Central ball clubs. So that 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 just ups his resume to be as a be a part of this Hall of Fame. Right. But I, I, I'm going to move on to my next pick, and this one's exciting. And I, and I know he he'll probably bring a smile to your face now that he's not playing against us and beating the shit out of us like he did for some time. But our next inductee is a player who played for five different teams, only one being an NL Central team. And he wasn't drafted and didn't finish in the Central, but he will be remembered most for his fantastic 11-year run in the division with the Cincinnati Reds. And I'm, of course, talking about Brandon Phillips. Uh, Phillips made his debut with Cleveland in 2002 and uh, played the options game for about four years before being traded to Cincinnati in 2006. And it didn't take long for him to become one of the best second basemen in all of baseball. In his 11 years that he spent with the Reds in the division, that dude won four gold gloves, he made three all-star games, he won a silver slugger, and became the first player in history, in all baseball history, to record two three-run homers, seven RBIs, and two stolen bases in a single game. So put his name in the record books for that one. In his time in the Central, Phillips hit 279, he hit 191 ding-dongs, 311 uh, doubles, 851 RBIs and a, and a whopping 194 stolen bases. 
In 2007, Phillips hit 30 home runs. He racked up 187 hits and stole 32 bags, becoming just the second second baseman in history to join the 30-30 club. Uh, he's also a legend to the Cincinnati community, contributing time and money to community projects in Cincinnati, including the Urban Youth Academy. He's a guy. He's a guy who smile whose smile lights up a stadium. And when I'm good and old, I'm going to open a pack of baseball cards and I see a Brandon Phillips card, I'm going to smile because he's that dude and he's an NL Central Hall of Famer forever. What do you think about Phillips? I like him. Uh, yeah, he was one that I didn't want to see come to the plate. But <laughs> right. at the end of the day, and that's, that's kind of what I was saying before. I mean, you know, it, as an opposing player, they're, they're a guy. And there, I think there was time where we were rumored to kind of have conversations and stuff like that. And, Absolutely. Tough one to face, but uh it's awesome. Yeah. I, I I think welcome aboard. He's uh he's definitely well worth the applause. You know, clap them all in. I didn't clap mine in. This one's for you. <laughs> all right. And yeah, Philip Phillips did it from every I mean three three massive tools. The guy hit with a lot of power, he stole a lot of bags, and I mean he could swipe a glove at second base. Um, excellent player, and I don't think a lot of people really, you know, talk about Brandon Phillips. I mean, I, I just wanted to bring up a guy that, like, damn, he he had those numbers really do fly off the page. I mean, a pretty low average for the time when people were hitting a little better, better average, but he he was toolsy as hell, and he had a 30 30 season. Brandon Phillips, legend in my book. All right, what do you got for your second pick? All right, so I'm gonna go, uh, <laughs> So one of the things that we discussed when we discussed this was uh, they can be active players. So uh, there's a guy right now that is active and I hope doesn't pitch very well this season, uh, but <laughs> has been a, but a legend, an absolute legend. Uh, I mean, him and his all-star catcher, Yadier Molina, uh, most consecutive uh, starts as a tandem, I believe, was the record, yep. and I don't remember yep. exactly what the record was. So Most starts I, as a tandem in history, yeah. You're right, and it was like some stupid high number that will never, ever be achieved again. Catchers don't play that long. <laughs> right. Uh, well, pitchers aren't going to pitch mean, that long. He's pitched since 2005. It's 2022. <laughs> that was a freshman, I think, in 2005. <laughs> I graduated high school. I just graduated high school in 2004. Right. So, <laughs> and Wayno's still doing it. He's going to pitch this year. He's going to pitch in the classic. Right. I mean, the guy is the guy is just. I can't. I'm not going to say fine wine because that's Verlander. But you know what I mean. He's only getting better. Yeah, he's only right. better. I mean, he's got. Count them here. One, two, three, four, five. Almost. Seven years, seven seasons that were 200 innings. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Guys don't touch 200 anymore. Right, right. I mean. <laughs> I think Sandy did this year, but I don't that's think. I think Burns just kissed it this year. Yeah, yeah. He just got there. Right. But, I mean, that's a huge number. And then here's the other thing that's really awesome about Wayno. Um. Besides his list of accolades, let's go to that first. Uh, Three-time All-Star. Uh, was, of course, a member of the 2006 World Series team. Uh, Two-time Gold Glover. Silver Slugger. Again, that, that pitcher Silver Slugger. I, I'm throwing those. I like those pitchers to hit. I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Bring back pitcher hitting. I actually have not revolted against a single rule change so far. I'd just like to point that out. I've been pretty on board with everything. I'm even okay with Ghost Runner coming back. As much think, little a sense as that makes. Love it or hate it, like it's going to make for an absolute bonkers baseball season. That's like, if you love it or hate it, it's still like must see TV. Like, I got to see what's going to happen, right? Right. Like, well, I, I want to see you guys play bags again. Like, I think if if they're doing these things in, the, in order to make progress and to make more more things happen, eventually what they want to happen will start to happen. And I think th these things that they've done this season and the conversations I've had, this will make an immediate impact. Um, I changed my idea on the um, Ghost Runner strictly because I thought about the usage of the pitchers and how I complain that I want to see pitchers go further 
Well, if you got to throw a starter in because you're going 17 innings, that's really affecting the overall health of the pitchers and the and the bullpen and, the bullpen, and everything like yeah. that. So. And, I mean, the players unanimously voted for it. I mean, the ghost runner might be the rule that I, I'm kind of against more. I think you, I think a better way to implement it would be, like, you do it after the 10th. I mean, sorry, like, after the 11th, 12th, maybe a little later innings, but whatever. Yeah. The players unanimously voted for it. They want it. They don't want to be up till 1.30 on a Thursday night when they got to make a road trip the next day. Right. You know, it's, it's just... It's they're already playing 162 plus spring training and plus postseason if you're a good play, a good t- team, you know. So right. we're just asking more and more of the guys. And and in three years, no one's going to give a crap about any of these rules. All you people out there, you're not going to care anymore. If if you love baseball, you're going to keep showing up. All right, I'm going to give you the stat line real quick. Not that we need it, but uh, he's got 46.7 career WAR. That's um, good. That's that's. <laughs> Uh, he has my contacts are dried out. 195 wins. I think he can throw up five dubs on the year. I think he can. Mm-hmm. He'll be a 200 mm-hmm. win player. Absolutely, he'll get the five. That's probably why he's playing this year. <laughs> right? He's probably like, shit, man, I'm so close. <laughs> I'm right there, man. And he's got he career, career ERA, uh, 457 games. Uh, three saves. Hold on, twenty five hundred and sixty seven major league innings of baseball. Wow! Wow! Okay, so this goes. This goes to. I watched Facing Nolan the other day. Yeah, I watched it. Excellent. You watched it? Okay. So I mean, they talk about everything that he did and all the. You know, there's there's nobody like Nolan Ryan. There won't be another Nolan Ryan ever again. Uh, but some of these guys, there, there won't be another Adam Wainwright. You know, there's yeah. we've watched history. Now you said you gra- uh, you were still in high school. I had graduated high school. Now this guy's been around most of my really? adult baseball watching career. You know, like I was I was a young adult watching this guy play, and he's still here, and I'm. I'm an older adult watching, you know, I'm almost 40. Right. We've had kids. We've had entire lifetimes of, of right. stuff happening in our lives, and Wayno's still pitching for the Cardinals. It's amazing. And yeah, you t- people talk about the Tom Brady's of the world, and like Adam Wainwright's doing it right before our eyes, too. And, and he's going to pitch for the, like, he's pitching an offseason baseball tournament, like <laughs> at 42 or 43. Like, unbelievable. I mean, and you could, I mean, you could go on stats for days with with this guy, but all right. Yeah, Adam Wainwright. Well, Absolutely. Adam Wainwright, first, first, first ballot inductee. Even Freddie's got to show some love, even though he's got to face off against him. Right, the time right. Of year. All right. Um, I also have an active player as my next uh, pick because uh, you got to throw one in there, and this guy is a lot of fun, and you know him, we love him. Uh, he's another second baseman, and he's put in 10 years in the NL sexiest division, the NL Central. And that player, of course, is Colton Wong. Um, as we all know, Wong is about to embark on his first season outside of the Central with the Mariners, my second favorite ball club, and also his first uh, season in the American League. Uh, he's a Hawaiian, uh, he's a Hawaiian-born ball player who uh, who starred in Kamehameha High School in Hawaii. If you're a Dragon Ball Z fan, which I'm not really. I think it's kind of cool, though, either way. Kamehameha High School is where he went. That's why. <laughs> he was drafted into the Central by the Redbirds in 2011 in the MLB draft. He spent his first eight seasons in St. Louis. He's a defensive first infielder, notching two gold gloves in his time there and winning three fielding Bible awards, all while accumulating just below average offensive numbers over his time there. Uh, St. Louis declined their co- club option for Wong. Um, after 2020, and the Brewers picked him up, of course, in his second straight NL Central team. He stepped it up at the plate in his time with the crew sport. Uh, he actually had his two best... Yes. <laughs> Long actually uh, had his two best offensive seasons in Milwaukee, believe it or not. Even even last year was one of his better offensive seasons um, measured when, when measured by OPS. Plus, he also had a career highs in home runs in back-to-back years with Milwaukee. And became a fan favorite and completed his 10th year in the NL Central, solidifying his place 
in the NL Central Hall of Fame. Best of luck to Colton with Seattle, of course. Much love to him. Colton Wong absolutely like is a perfect mention for this Hall of Fame. He was a guy that was just flashing leather <laughs> for 10 years in the, in the division. And it was he was one of those guys couldn't stand him when he was playing against us, but when he came to us, just instant fan favorite. Got to love Colton Wong. What do you think? Agreed. Agreed. Colton, Colton was one again, you know, like he, he would burn you because he'd come up and he'd get those hits off of Giovanni Gallardo. Uh, you know, he, 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 he was a game wrecker. He was a heartbreaker. He uh, but then he was our ball. heartbreaker. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And he has a little baby when he was here and you he couldn't help mm -hmm. but like love that he was all on, all on board with being a Packers fan and a brewer. You know, it was great. I mean, much love to the guy. I really Seattle, great place for him. Perfect home for him. Yeah, I think that I think that, that trade greased the wheels for us to trade for Julio. So I think we're good there. <laughs> I thought we were holding on for Shohei. Yes. Oh no. We, yeah, that's right. That was my other theory. We should start right a hashtag. Me. Hold out for Shohei. Yes. You know how many teams and then are holding out the... for Shohei. It's it's a crowded room. The problem right, like, is we're we're only getting two hundred ninety three million dollars from the taxpayers, and I think you need five hundred to get show hat. Right. So we gotta we're gonna have to come up with some slush fund money, raise those ticket prices. We don't need to do construction this summer. Just let the roads rot. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but Colton Wong, absolutely first first ballot NL Central Hall of Famer. Just the guy you, you just love to watch play. He's so amazing at second base. One of the best defenders in all of baseball still to this day. And his offensive numbers are only getting better. So you want to hit the applause for Cole Wong? Cole Wong, first ballot. Who you got love, next? Love me some Colton Wong. Chicks dig the Wong ball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely that, that's a shirt that's available on base uh, for, uh what's it called oh my gosh i just had it baseballism no no it's the other one uh player tees or whatever it's called yeah yeah that's a great site i, I love tees. i Breaking love surfing tees. through there they've got some great shirts all right so yeah. i'm gonna go a little old school on you i'm kicking it old school with this one okay uh so this this guy's got a list He's already in the pro, the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. He's an MVP, four-time All-Star, three-time Silver Slugger, Rookie of the Year, Gold Glover, and a Player of the Year. And he played for the NL Central Houston Astros. That's right. I forgot, right? I mean, it, not long ago, the the Astros were a member of our division. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we were talking about none other than first baseman Jeff Bagwell. Bags. And uh, this this one, you know, you think I've given out some big wars so far, right? <laughs> this one, this one is, is is double the best player that I've mentioned. A 79.9 career war. Ooh. Oof. Ooh. It's juicy. It's Ooh. juicy. That's juicy. Uh, 7,797 7, at bats, 2,314 <laughs> hits, 449 career home runs, uh, 297 batting average, 15. 117 runs, 1,529 RBIs, uh, 202 stolen bases, an OBP of 408, a slugging of 540, and an OPS of 948. OPS plus That's of 149. Massive OPS. I mean, those are huge, That's, huge numbers. It's monster. I mean, we don't have a guy. There isn't guys like this. And I mean, batting average, batting average numbers. Uh, I've got something to bring up about Trout later. Remind me. Uh, I was just reading it while I was listening to you. Uh, but like, there's just there ain't guys like this. This isn't this isn't a common, and it's kind of a golden era of that 
I mean, he really played from the 90s to the 2000s. You know Golden what I mean? era of really, baseball. And that, that was the hitting time. That was really the hitting time. I think we've kind of, and you and I have talked about this on your, your old podcast, but we're kind of in that pitcher's time. This is more of a pitcher's time than anything. The batting averages have dropped overall. So that was the window where guys just mashed. Mm-hmm. And there were still some great pitchers in that era, too. I mean, you know, your Schmoltz's, your Glavin, your Pedro. Pedro's, you know, God, there's so many. But guys still mashed. Yeah. That's amazing that there was yeah. pros and cons, both sides, like an even, it was like an even baseball. I think we'll right. get back was, there. Though. We'll get back there, and these little changes will, will affect that certainly. But yeah, it was absolutely the, the golden age of, era of the hitter. It was. I consider the late 90s, early 2000s my golden era for baseball watching. Like That was when you had all the sluggers and all the great pitches, the Pedros, the Yankees dominance of that time. And yeah, Jeff Bagwell, you could, gosh, you could arguably put him on the Mount, Ru- Mount Rushmore of early 2000s baseball. Like you, right. really, you really could make a case for Jeff Bagwell. That Astros team that made the World Series in 05 was just nuts. <laughs> like, and... They, they didn't win that World Series, but it was just full of mashers. I think Kurt Schilling was on the team. Randy Johnson was on the team at that time. Just And and, and bag, Bags was just in the middle of all that. Right. Like, well, and here's, here's another thing, and this was something that effectively Wild was talking about recently, and I just fucking love this. I fucking love it, and I'm going to – I'm saying it that strongly because I mean it. He has one, two, three, four, four seasons – where he played all 162. He has 160, 158, 156, 159, 161. I mean, guy didn't take time off. That's an right. old school mentality that you don't see in players. No. And if you went down the Brewers cool. roster, I don't think there's a, there's anybody that touches close to as many games. Maybe a Willie Adamas because he doesn't like to take time off. I think Yelich got like to 158 or something last year, real close. And was he? Fielder, okay. Fielder was our guy that would play every game. I think he had right. He was the games. model of consistency, the, the most yeah. recent one that you can remember in Brewers history. But outside of that, yeah, there's not there's not guys like that. And, and back to Jeff Bagwell's, like just his hitting numbers again. Like if you look at those seasons, you take any of those prime seasons at Bagwell, and he probably was. You know, you said four. You said one MVP. You said four All Stars. Mm-hmm. He would have had all the MVPs in today's baseball, all the All Star selections. Like he was at a time when everybody was not everybody, but there were so many more masters at the time. But like if you if you cut and paste Jeff Bagwell's numbers into 2023, like he would be Mike Trout. <laughs> like absolutely, like he was right, that right. good at a time right. when everybody was that good. And like you alluded to, the pitching was historically good at that time in a lot of ways. Right. So yeah. Just you can't say different era. Bags. It's just a different era. It just talks about when and you know we kind of we're kind of sprinkling guys in here, and I love this about this because we can talk about guys from different eras, much like the modern Hall of Fame, which he's already a part of. Mm-hmm. But you've got so many guys of a different eras and different different uh, pieces of baseball that fit in, and I think that's kind of where where they got into that debate this year. And there was the obviously the steroid controversy with Barry Bonds. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, you only saw Fred McGriff, and uh, um, help me. I thought Fred McGriff Scott Rowland would have got in. There. Oh, Scott Rowland, yeah. Scott Rowland and Fred McGriff were the only two. The and, uh, and it's because of of the the confusion between the writers of what the standards are and all this. I mean, if you you can listen, yeah. to days and days of content on that. But yeah, yeah, they don't so like they, yeah. Even the even the writers themselves. That's what the contemporary uh, era of ballad is all about. It's like, yeah, we miss, we might have missed a lot of guys, and and we're looking at the numbers in today's baseball, and these guys are deserving. Like right. just because right. they got overshadowed by their contemporaries, who were the Willie Mazes of the world and the Joe DiMaggio's and the Pete Roses, it's like they dwarf the competition. But those competitions numbers are still three hundred batting averages. You know. 300 career home runs, like really good numbers. So it's like, it's, a, it, it's, and it, it's, for the number of guys that have played Major League Baseball, there's such a limited number in the Hall of Fame 
Uh, and I, I, I've already made this comment, but you know, guy, Brewers guys, to, to ever scrape the Hall of Fame, you would have to be hella, hella freaking good. And yeah, I don't think there's a modern era Brewer that's ever going to get there. I really don't. No, I mean, and we're going to have that debate in guy. the future. Yeah, but, yeah, we might have, we might have some guys right now, perhaps, who are going to get in, but like nobody over the last 20, 25 years. Absolutely. Right. So, speak. Uh, one thing I want, one last thing on the Hall of Fame I want to say is uh, they get most everything wrong, but I like the contemporary players ballot. But even that they got wrong because they left Barry Bonds out, and and that's that's a good segue to my next pick for the NL Central Hall of Fame is a guy who will not. You got something quick? Oh yeah, sure. bag wall. What else? Bags. The Hall of Fame. Bags. Um, a guy who probably won't make the Hall of Fame, and in my opinion, it's because the writers get things wrong, and uh, and it may be controversial, but it's my it's our Hall of Fame, and any player who meets our criteria is eligible. And the dude was must see TV for me as a kid growing up with w- WGN on my TV. I always had that on between that and TBS. I watched a lot of Braves. I watched a lot of Cubs. I got to admit, along with the Brewers, um, and steroid guys get in here. And you cannot have an NL Central Hall of Fame without slamming Sammy Sosa. <laughs> Sammy Sosa is a legend. I don't care what you say about him. I don't care about what you say about his skin tone now and how he might have turned white. I don't care what you say about the, the roids. The guy was amazing and he just crushed. So let's go over the numbers. He spent 13 years tearing up the Central. In those 13 years, this is going to even dwarf Bagwell's numbers. He hit 545 home runs. That's an average of 42 a year. He hit 1,414 RBIs. He walked 798 times. He slugged 569, and he was 39% better than the league average hitter. And this was at a time when seemingly everybody was juicing. And he was still 40% better than the league average hitter when everyone was doing it. He hit his 400th home run in his 1,354th game, which made it quicker than anyone in history to get to 400 home runs. He's one of only nine players to get 600 career home runs. Pujols is now on that list. He is a seven-time All-Star. He was the 1998 NL MVP, six-time Silver Slug winner, 99 Hank Aaron Award winner, the 98 Clemente Award winner. He is the two-time home run champ, two-time NL RBI leader. He's the only player in Major League Baseball history to hit 60 home runs three times, which he did in 98, 99, and 2001. But this is crazy. In all those seasons where he hit over 60, he didn't lead baseball in home runs those years. Because 98, you had Mark McGuire hitting 70. 99, I think Big Mac hit like a few more than Sosa. I think he had like 63 and Sosa mm-hmm. had like 60. And then in 2001, again, he had over 60 and still got over <laughs> for Sosa. Um, a little side note, though. Real quick, he did, he did beat Big Mac out. For all-time career leaderboard after they retired. So, Sammy See? Sosa is ranked number nine with 609 career home runs. And Mark McGuire is ranked five eight, uh, number 11 with 583, only separated he, by Frank Robinson at 586. Man, did Frank Robinson hit a lot of home runs. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, like, yeah, uh, Big Mac may have won the battle. You know the home run chase, but Sammy Sosa won the war, and I think, man, brother, I think I think Mark McGuire ended up coming coming out looking worse in the end. By the end of it, I mean neither of them neither of them were ever positively tested, but but both of them we know what happened. Um, despite how the public may feel about his alleged steroid use, his skin doing the Michael Jackson thing, he is possibly the best hitter in the NL Central history. And he's one of the Cubs' all-time greats. I personally love Sammy Sosa. And if you want to remember the greatness of Sammy Sosa, don't go look back at his home runs. Don't go look back at the, the home run chase. Don't look back at that stuff. Go pull up on YouTube the video of him after 9-11, the first game the Cubs played after 9-11. You'll see Sammy Sosa running around with the tiniest little cute American flag, a Dominican ball player running around on, on Wrigley Field just showing pride in the country that let him live his dream. 
that that image will always be etched into my mind of Sammy Sosa, and that's why he's so beloved to me. <laughs> like I just love the guy. I had his banner on the wall. I was always rooting for him in the home run chase, and he just loved America, and, and it's that they got this opportunity to play here and live his dream. So Sammy Sosa's forever a legend and NL Central Hall of Famer. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, real quick note: Jeff Bagwell, uh, number forty-one on the all-time home run leaderboard. That's so. a nice place to be. Right. I mean, anybody that I feel like anybody on this list deserves a nod. Yeah. Anybody on this list from, you know, I'd say, I don't know. I don't know what number you stop at. I mean, 300 is an awesome number. 400, 500, you know? I mean, 400 guys aren't getting good too, you know, <laughs> these days. I mean, you had pool holes get to 600, but yeah. I think 500 is the mark. But Sammy Sosa deserves a yeah, round of applause because he was one. <laughs> You're getting good. Throughout the course of this podcast, you've gotten real good at those. Uh, who's your next pick? My next pick is another Chicago Cup. Cubby Bear. This Chicago Cup is still active. Uh, he was part of a controversial... Um, disappearing of uh, the greatness of the Chicago Cubs so just makes it even more bittersweet for for all of us who are root for the uh, the hometown team in Milwaukee uh, this guy is uh, a World Series champion a three-time all-star a four-time gold Glover a silver slugger a platinum Glover Glover first platinum Glover in the Hall of Fame yes. Uh, he has a war of 39.2. Uh, now, again, he's active, so 5,578 at bats, uh, 1,400 hits, 283 home runs, a 265 Ooh. batting average, 839 runs, uh, 889 for RBIs, 72 stolen bases, OBP of 366, 481. 847 OPS and a 127 OPS plus. His name is Anthony Rizzo. Riz. Rizzo. And uh, you know, the guy, the guy spent a lot of time playing against us, and I, I had a I, I talked about a deep-seated hatred for a guy, uh, for players, and this was one of my things. Like I, I love to hate these guys, but now I can I can be happy. You know, even that 2016 run for the Cubs was really Really awesome to see these guys all kind of click together. Brian, Rizzo. Uh, they had some really great commercials. The Brizzo Souvenir Company. Um, it was just a really good era of Cubs baseball, and they, they managed to get Aroldis Chapman in time to seal the deal, to use him enough to put a World Series in Chicago for the first time. So, so uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, as much as I... Yeah, I mean the the Javi Baez's and the Jason Haywards. There's so many guys. I love to that hate those guys. Love to hate them, but Rizzo, man, he, I, uh, something people may forget: the guy had cancer when he was, I think, 18 years old. Leukemia, right? Can What's that? Was it yeah, leukemia? leukemia. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He battled cancer and got over it and became a World Series champion. And like, yeah, I I, I don't like the Cubs. I'm a Brewers fan, of course, but 16. Man, it was hard not to root for the Cubby Bears in that in that playoff run. Man, that was such a great World Series. Mm -hmm. Anthony Rizzo, I'm, I'll never forget the image of him putting the ball. You know, Chris Bryant got the ball, threw it to Rizzo. He was Ezra. <laughs> and, and Rizzo put the ball in his back pocket because he didn't know what to do with it after making that final out of the World Series. And he's just like, I don't know what to do. I'm going to shove it in my pocket. And it's just such a kid thing. And those guys were just a, a young crop of kids kids and it they just had that youthful energy and, and yeah kyle schwarber man a lot of fun and yeah anthony rizzo he did enough time in this in the division for sure to be a to be a first ballot and i'll central hall of famer oh, you got to sure. give love to riz for sure do you want do you want me to do my next one and uh you do you take care of i i got one more too Hold on can, can you uh start giving yours and i'll take i'll put it yeah yeah you do what you gotta do there that's what i was saying right. yeah. as we say say goodbye Goodbye. Bye. Say <laughs> goodbye, everyone. We're talking to the world. Yeah. Ezra's a big baseball fan. She's going to be a pitcher. Be right back. All right. <laughs> All right. So uh, 
my next guy here is uh, a, another former brewer. Um, he's a one-time All Star, World Series winner. Um, guy has a twenty-one point nine WAR, four thousand seven hundred at bats, twelve hundred ninety-three hits, two hundred twenty-one home runs, two seventy-five yeah, career good. batting average. 688 for runs, 733 for RBIs, 32 stolen bases, OBP of 344, uh, 490 slugging, OPS of 834, and an OPS plus 114. His name is Jeffrey Jenkins, aka Brett Favre 2. Uh, yes. one of one of the greats of of the Brewers organization, uh, the Jenkins Jungle, was a fond memory for me out at uh, the old Miller Park. Yeah, the old Miller Park. Yeah, I think I put him at – I made a list uh, about a year ago or so as my top ten Brewers of all time, and I think I put Jenkins at five or six. I think, yeah, he's another guy who a lot of people don't remember. I mean, an amazing piece on a losing ball club. He never got the, he never got the chance to be a part of the Brewers winning that happened after he left. But he did get some winning of his own, which I'll let you mention that. But like Jeff Jenkins, I mean, he he was a huge piece along with like the Richie Sexons at right, a time when right. the Brewers were losing a lot of ball games. But they were th- those were the guys putting us in the seats at that right, time. right. That's what we paid to see, and a guy like that that would go out. I mean, he didn't he didn't range any any full seasons. Uh, he was he was kind of injury prone. Uh, the guy was a strikeout machine. He struck out a lot, but that's because he was also ma- you know, swinging to mash. Yeah. Uh, but he he averaged 135 to 150 games at, at I mean throughout his time. So he spent a lot of time. He was a gamer. He went out there every day. Uh, he just, you could just see that energy on his face. He was one of those guys that you were like, God, I, I love this guy. I have a picture, and it's probably not in my office right now, but I have a picture of my best friend and I. Uh, and my my friend, this was at one of the like inaugural on decks at uh, Miller Park. And my friend made the joke. He's like, "Do you want me to make a, um, Jeff Jenkins really uncomfortable?" And I'm like, "Yeah, what are you gonna do?" And he's like, "Okay, I'll go up there." So he goes up there, and he like kind of like Jeff was posing like this over a chair or something like that, and he like went under like up underneath. And like, kind of hugged him from behind, and I took the picture, and I was just dying, and had to, like, I didn't even get my picture. I think I didn't. I maybe I did, but like, so I had to run away laughing. And... Just so like was like hugging him from hugging? behind. He was like holding him, like a bear hug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Jeff Jenkins. Yeah, that's a memory, man. That's good stuff. Because pro- because I bet if you ask Jeff Jenkins that about that now, he'd probably be like, "Yeah, I remember that. What what the hell was wrong with that guy?" <laughs> Like I was a little weird. I thought I thought I was gonna have to you know, fight him. Right, just just more Milwaukee fans doing crazy things. Ah, uh, he's probably drunk. It's okay. Right, but yeah, Jeff Jenkins. Yeah, he was he was one of the guys that gave us fans hope when we needed it most for to keep us going to the ball club. I mean, he he's, played time in County Stadium too. He's famous for that '90s era baseball. If you would mm-hmm. if you would give me players to associate that '90s logo. Not the current logo, but the '90s logos, you know, like yeah. the ones from um, Mister Three Thousand, the Mister yeah. Three Thousand era. Oh, right, right. Him and Cirillo, I'd put in that uniform. Um, that would be what I'd remember that 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 logo in that era from. Yeah, I mean, the, Jeff Jenkins was the, my my guy on MVP Baseball 2005. <laughs> Jeff Jenkins and Sexton crushing dingers with them on that game, man. When I was right. a kid. Making the Brewers win a World Series when they couldn't do scrap eighty wins back in the day, <laughs> but absolute so, legend, Jeff Jenkins. All right, the last dude who will be, we will be inducting into this inaugural class is a fourteen-year MLB vet. He's still an active ball player who spent a decade between two NL Central teams lighting up the division and bringing pride back to a city whose baseball team had been lacking for over a decade. That man, of course, that I'm talking about is a furry fan. If you, I don't know if you ever watch baseball doesn't exist. He has videos on how um, this man is a furry fan and his beloved fan favorite, Andrew McCutcheon. Uh, 
He was a 11th overall pick by the Pirates in 2005, eventually making his debut in 2009. During his time in the Central, he was the 2013 National League MVP, a five-time All-Star, four-time Silver Slugger, and the 2015 Clemente Award winner. A distinguished honor, especially for a Pirate, being that Clemente spent all those years as a Pirate. He led the National League in hits in 2012 with 194, on base percentage in, 12, in 2012 with a 410, and he led in 2012 with an OPS of 952. And in 2014, he led the National League in extra base hits with 69. Um, in his time in the Central, he hit, he hit 267 home runs, 794 RBIs. He had an above average uh, OPS or 550 OPS or 850 OPS, and he was 34% better than the leading average hitter for a decade in the division. He helped to bring back winning baseball culture to an amazing baseball city who had been going through its baseball dark ages in the time. Andrew McCutcheon brought pride back to Pittsburgh. He, he he led that team when they went on their playoff runs, those wild card runs that they had. Andrew McCutcheon, he's a legend, and he's coming back now to the city that made him and to help mentor the young, talented crop of players that they got waiting in the wings out in Pittsburgh. I think that's the main reason they brought him back there. One, so he can have a, you know, a final run at his home club because he is a, he is a living legend out there, and to to, to mentor the O'Neill Cruises that they got over there and the young talent they got. Um, he's one of my favorite players to watch of the 2010s, essentially, and, and before that. And he's uh, he spent a decade in the NL Central, and he dominated. And now he, he's back in Pittsburgh again. So what do you think? Good candidate for the Hall of Fame? Money. I love it. Money. Uh, this has been a great list. I mean, I think we covered some names. We covered some generations of NL Central Baseball. And there's still more to talk about. That's the great part. This, yeah. this can of worms, we can do an episode every month, you know? Yeah. I don't know if that was the format you had planned. You you plan all this. I let Butcher write and plan all his own episodes. So he just kind of tells me what he's going to do. And then I just press the button. Or, you know, press press what he's going to do and tell him, okay, that's cool. I like that. Or give him ideas <laughs> if I can, you know, but it's all on him. So, and that's, that's how we do it here. I mean, this, this, this comes down to a fact of like, it's fun to recognize players that we've watched over time. And have been a part of our, our history of baseball, because, you know, we, we live in the NL central. This is our yeah. home. here. Yeah. As much as sometimes we may not like it because the Cardinals have kicked our ass for years for the Cubs. Oh, or we often have the worst division in baseball by record a lot of times. Like we end up with a lot of that. But it's it's a it's a division that has some of the oldest teams in baseball between the Cardinals, Cubs, Pirates, Reds. Those are some of the oldest clubs, and we're just kind of a younger brother to those teams. But we've been dominating the last few years, right? I, I think I saw a stat board, and I, I think I shared it. Uh, but like the last five years, we were right up there with like some of the best teams. Uh, Dodgers, you know, everybody. We we're, we were right in the the right in the mix. I want to say we were top like five, six. I think we for, were top five for yeah. wins over the last. I think it was ten years or maybe eight years, right? Something like that. But yeah, absolutely, we have been a dominating force. And you mentioned it earlier. We thought you and I were jaw jack, and Pacota's got the Brewers pegged to win the division. Yeah, the and that was that was one of the things I wanted to touch on. Pacota's got us. Uh, so right now is the time where everybody's kind of coming out and doing predictions. Uh, yesterday, I talked with Dom. Uh, we did some predictions there. And uh, all positive. There's a lot of positive. If you pick up this Lens magazine that I've referenced 100 freaking times over the last week, uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there talking about the crew and uh, just the positives, the outlooks that are out there for us. Uh, so a lot of good vibes going into the season. Uh, the Butcher and I have been talking about how excited we are doing these episodes every day, uh, preparing uh, as much as Butcher doesn't do an episode every day, he's still preparing and watching what I do, and kind of and kind of bouncing off of me. We bounce back and forth. I bounce so much off of him. He's like my man behind the scenes, ninety percent of the time. So it's good to have him alongside me. Uh, and he's originally my motivation for being being on a podcast kind of platform. So I appreciate him for being there for I, that. I appreciate you, and I appreciate the creative control. I like it. No problem. That's what I love to do, man. So we got a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of news in baseball, and I wanted to. That was part of the part of the reason I also wanted to participate is because I didn't want to leave a day 
because I did two back-to-back -back interviews, I didn't get to really talk about the news that was kind of transpiring and everything going on because I was talking more directly with the guests that I have. So when I have a guest on, I always want to, you know, kind of get them to get their, their, their piece and direct them a certain way in a conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, now you see in the second conversation with Dom, I was able to get more out of him. Uh, and I always want to do that, but because I think it's more interesting to watch, it's more educational for us because Dom's got such a brain. I was actually listening to him before I hopped on with, well, I was listening to him while I was reading with my kid, making sure he got medicine, making sure he brushed his teeth, doing all that stuff. I was listening to Dom in my ear. I had an ear yeah. AirPod on and I was walking around listening to it and cleaning dishes and all that stuff that dads have to do before bedtime. Um, and he was actually talking about the Corbin Burns situation, the money from the state. So I'm going to briefly uh, sum some of this up here. Uh, basically with Corbin Burns, where we sit is uh, he lost the case. Now that does not mean that there's animosity or anger. There's tons of players every year that lose loses cases to their major league ball club. What that means is the arbiter didn't see the value that Corbin Burns asked for in his amount of time and all the factors that they judge. Now these factors aren't factors we see. Like it doesn't matter necessarily as much that he's an NL Cy Young winner. You know, yes, it does in a way, but it also looks at timing and things of that nature. So therefore where a Corbin Burns gets less money than a Brandon Woodruff, who you look at Corbin Burns, you're like, well, he's a better pitcher than a Brandon Woodruff. But Brandon Woodruff's time also started before Corbin Burns' time started. Corbin Burns actually got sent down more than Brandon Woodruff got sent down. So um, those are a lot of the factors, and that's why he's coming in at like $10.1 million. I mean, the guy's still being paid very well for, for a rookie contract. I mean, you look at you look at the rookie contracts of uh other players that are out there. Uh, Max Fried is actually currently in the process of doing the same thing with the uh, World Series winning Atlanta Braves. I mean, even they do it. And those guys lock people up as soon as they get them. Yeah. Yeah, Which it's absolute. It's, 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 the, it's headline material when they put uh, he loses case to arbiter. It's not like Corbin Burns is sitting in a courtroom with the arbiter and and, and fighting for his money. Uh, it's his agent that does all these dealings. And it's something that happens to every player. It, it, there's four years of arbitration when you become a big league player and the clock starts ticking when you make your major league debut. And, and it goes based on service time. And it, it, it is partially performance-based, how the arbiter decides these things. But it's, it's like you said, service time. It's innings pitched because they are a union just because you are a better, per se, pitcher in those first four years of arbitration. It's more of a workplace setting where you put in your certain amount of time and they do compare you to other players who are performing at that at that who's so if, if Corbin Burns has three years, 260 days of service time, they're going to compare him to other p pitchers who have three years, 260 days of service time, and they're going to compare those and 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 judge the salary based on that. But every player has to go through it. And we could have chose, yes, to pay him now and lock him up for a salary. But I, I have my theories on that too. I think the Brewers do want to see what the what the new offensive rules have in in terms of the numbers that the pitchers are going to have against those new rules. So, Shohei Otani. It Shohei Otani. Yeah. So it, it really <laughs> it it sounds like our Corbin Burns is going to come out pissed and angry this season. But honestly, I I wouldn't even mind having a pissed Corbin Burns. It means he's going to pitch lights out and try to prove something this year, don't you think? But that's absolutely not the case. Corbin Burns. Is, is working on his routine every single day, and this affects his routine and his him as a player at zero percent, I believe. Yeah, and and I, I'm right, I'm right there with you. I was just reading a, a, a reply that I got on a comment I made on Twitter, uh, but I was saying, yeah, like, and I said to these guys, I said, you know, it's like put the pitchforks down, you know. I, I think there's so much, and it's funny because when I have these conversations with guys like Dom, and I have these conversations with. Uh, Jeff Levering and stuff like that. Like, they wish they didn't have to be on the internet at times because it's such an ugly place. Because you know everyone's so quick to pitch up, pick up a pitchfork and and hate the Brewers for this topic. And then 
be so angry about where we are, but at the same time, it, the business of baseball is what it is. Now, do I wish that we could do things like a, and I think this all comes in with the Steve Cohn conversation that I had earlier this season. Yeah, I think the Bruce could do the Steve Cohn thing, but it's going to take a lot for other teams and certain teams. I don't think Pittsburgh's going to automatically go to Steve Cohn mentality. You know what I mean? I don't think no. that these teams are going to start, and, and even teams with money still fight cases. Uh, you know, the Royals don't have a big payroll, and I believe they're fighting it out with their best pitcher right now. I yeah, think they it's, just it's, won their case with their best pitcher. Yeah, it's nearly – it's and, and the, the arbiter is not placed by the team. The arbiter is a complete private party. It's always a third party. They have no interest in the player or the club. They just have interest in getting a deal done. And it's simply it, – it, it, the headlines make it sound so bad and like it's this – this battle that the teams are having with the players, but it's simply it's it's decimal points on a on a piece of paper that that matter very little to either at this point essentially. Like I it's not very like often you hear man. players speak out against an arbitration well, case. From yeah, and that's exactly it. They look at they look at the the numbers on each side of the coin and then they decide, okay, yep, this one looks better. You know? Yeah. Um one of the things I would have to say is uh baseball is a is a knowledge game. And as a fan, um, it's not as clear cut as like a football with salaries and salary caps and things like that. So those things are very hard for people to understand. <laughs> rock star. We got a rock star in the house. I might have to do oh, that. yeah. <laughs> you guys step away for a second. I might yeah, I might have to. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go go into the next part here. So do what you gotta do. All right, so the next part I wanted to talk about real brief. I'm gonna just pop my oh nope, I just popped him up. Uh, Sorry, buddy, I, I can't just say in the middle of a podcast I need to go. And she just pulled all those out of there. So uh, the the big thing here, the next part was the uh, 290 million uh, proposed spending for uh, Milwaukee Brewers. Now, what what this money is meant to meant to do is meant to go to is uh, the basically the stadium district. So essentially, the 290 million proposed by Governor Evers is meant to keep the Brewers for a 20 year period. It's not money that they have flexible to spend on payroll, to i.e., spend on Corbin Burns or anything like that. It's money that is basically made for stadium budgeting, things like that, fixing the stadium. They just use some tax money to. Um, put a new PA system in, new speakers, basically throughout the ballpark. So that's right. kind of what the money is there for, and that's what they're doing with it. Uh, and it's a proposal. It's nothing nothing set in stone, nothing's etched yet. So there's not really much to talk about on that until it passes. Uh, but it basically, it just extends the time that we have the Brewers, which is a positive for us. It's not tax money. Um, if you don't know anything about what's going on with the Wisconsin budget right now, we have a surplus. So that's where that money is coming from, the surplus of COVID money and all this government funding that we've been receiving. So that's really kind of the, the meat and potatoes of what I wanted to say on that. Um, the other thing that I was going to cover real in brief is the uh, there's, a, there's a bonus. Um, right now, to us, there could be the potential that we're going to see MLB.tv be the, the the winner and we're going to have no blackouts. Uh, it was mentioned again in conversation today that Rob Manfred uh, is, is prepared to back up because Diamond has failed to make payments that it needs to make. So Rob Manfred is coming out to the podium and saying, hey, I'm here. We have the infrastructure to do this. We're going to do it if it's necessary and when it's necessary. So those are the major key points. Uh, a couple injury notes. The Gram is can, currently on. Can I just make one? Yeah, can I go just ahead. Make one go point ahead. about Manfred. If if uh, Manfred ends the blackouts, puts everything on one app. You know, MLB TV is your your one stop shop for your local, your postseason, your World Series. It will it will fix Rob Manfred's legacy, at least in my eyes. Oh, if for he, sure, for sure. All the know. all the other crap. I will personally brush under the rug if he can fix blackouts because he would be the first to do it and bring right. baseball, all baseball to all fans, which is 
should be the number one priority of major league baseball. I, I may not yeah. forget I may not forget piece of metal, but you know. <laughs> right, right. I'll, right. I'll do my best. I'll, I I promise I will do my best. He's had a lot right. of miscues, but still have That was the worst. I uh, mean, there was commissioners who wouldn't let black people play. They're way worse than Manfred. Come on. Right. Oh, true. True, <laughs> true that. True that. This whole Negro League era. Uh, but yeah. So uh, basically, there's a couple injuries, big injuries out there. Nasty Nestor is injured, not of the world, uh, world Baseball Classic. Montaz is looking like he's going to have season ending, ending surgery. The Grom is currently on hold, which the Grom, that's no surprise. I mean, it's I early. think we all expect injuries with the Grom. Uh, and then uh, Strasburg is constantly injury prone, so it's not even a shock. I honestly, I he's one of those I keep forgetting his play. I because he doesn't ever pitch a whole lot of games every season, and now he's on this. He's paid a lot match. of money too. Remember what the Nationals paid him? I mean, he was oh. tops. He would think of what he did in this World Series, and then yeah, immediately after that series, we he has not been the same guy. He has not been able to stay on the mound to save his life, and. It'd be a real shame if this is how the end of the Steven Strasburg career plays yeah. out the rest of the it's way. It's the end of the world as we know it. He's yeah. the top pitching prospect of all time. And it'd be a shame if he fizzles out. Right. After this, yeah. Okay, and then the last one, Trout's goals. Make the playoffs. Convince Otani to stay. I saw that, yes. Yeah. I love those. I love those headlines. So that's just me yeah, reading. I think those are one and the same. I think... Trout needs Otani to make playoffs, and to make playoffs, he needs Otani. Right. So I think they're right. synonymous. <laughs> right, that, those go hand in hand. It's like, well, you can't have, can't have one without the other. Love and marriage. Yeah. I'm just not singing, Spree. Okay, it's getting late. It's getting late. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. <laughs> Did you have any notes on today's episode? Yeah, this no. guy's the rock star. This guy is our true rock star. He's the rock star of the podcast. So, uh, see, see, Kid Ego to at a at a bar this summer, or festival this summer. It's a band I play bass in. Kid My Ego, God. shout out, shout <laughs> out, shout out. Rock Check them out. <laughs> no, I got nothing else. Baseball, it's so much going on. The season's getting close. There's so much to talk about. We'll be talking to you guys a lot in the future. Um, give me, give us your thoughts on the NL Central Hall of Fame your takes give us your thoughts on uh some of these hot topics that are going on right now what you think about the 293 million in the budget and all that uh, there's so much man and we're getting closer and i can feel my 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 heart rate start to increase as we get ready to embark on this bonkers 2023 season right right and it just keeps getting better just keeps getting yeah. better so that's all i got today guys we are out skis uh as always Remember to like, subscribe, uh, rate, and review. We really appreciate that. Uh, we keep bringing you more stuff. We got more people we're working with. I think even Butcher may have a special episode coming up if, if things work out right. Uh, so, as always, guys, go Brewers. Sue pitch great. Don't widen the plate. And you guys have a great rest of your night. Thanks for watching.